All right, so now we're ready to move on to the companion piece to uh, the, the Hertzfeld chapter, Mine, Patronage, Face, Vulnerability, Articulations of Human Rights in Thailand. So this is a, uh, a chapter that appears in the book, but it's also uh, a version of this also appeared in the International Journal of Human Rights <clears throat> and in the interest of not violating copyright, which is a good idea. Um, we're, we're not looking at the one from the book, we're looking at the International Journal of Human Rights. Now, uh, so I'm going to try to walk you through both what I'm doing with the paper and what, uh, what the objective of the paper is at one and the same time. Uh, we'll see if this works. So at the outset, um, the scenario I'm describing is uh, when a group of us uh, lawyers who I was accompanying to Southern Thailand and their team, uh, that uh, their, their uh, support team, uh, and um, we were in a van going from some of the southern provinces that were hit by the tsunami in 2004, at the end of 2004, and we were on our way north. And this very senior, well-respected lawyer, Chok Chai, had uh, volunteered to give the, um, the, the owner of the van uh, the, and the driver, therefore, a spell from driving. And, um, and he had forgotten to take off the emergency brakes. So eventually the back brakes uh, burned through and started smoking. And, and it, it sort of, um, it was disruptive to the project of getting back to, to Bangkok. Um, but the thing that I wanted to show with that section and with the way that the other lawyers and the other members of the team responded to what can safely be described as a fiasco was um, I wanted to point out how their efforts to sort of uh, dull Chok Chai's embarrassment over the whole scenario uh, show, first of all, how concerns about face work, about saving face, preserving face, avoiding losing face, that these are pervasive and uh, in in uh, Thai social interactions, that is, and uh, and and so this was a particularly vivid uh, example of how it is that a group of people who are um, respectful toward Chok Chai because they they think he's a good guy, but who are also his uh, inferiors in in the particular context in which we were operating, the, the lawyers and the work that they were doing, how they work to um, reduce his loss of face or his embarrassment over this snafu. Uh, and this is part of the second point that I'm trying to make with the piece, is that, uh, or at least with the introduction to the piece, is that saving face is not just your own individual concern, but if you're in an inferior position especially, it's a concern that uh, neither your loss of face um, affect your superior, nor that you cause your superior loss of face through something that you do. I get to an example of that later in the chapter. Nor that something that your superior does to cause him or her loss of face is um, it is something that you uh, allow to go on and, uh, and, and cost your superior the greatest amount that it could. You want to blunt, in other words, the effects of your superior losing face as well. So in other words, it's not the, the idea of face work is not organized just around preserving your own face, but is also organized around trying to uh, protect your superiors from loss of face, self-inflicted or inflicted from elsewhere. So first section, research context. This section broadly describes 
where I did field work. So first of all, at the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand, and then through contacts that I formed there. So the work that, that I was doing, the research that I was doing at the commission mostly took place in the secretariat. So not among commissioners, but among the staff who supported the commissioners and who did the lion's share of the, the work, the investigative work, the reporting, uh, and, and so forth. And uh, so many of the people who worked there had a legal background. The person I was closest to was a lawyer herself. And so she knew these lawyers who were also working under the auspices of the National Human Rights Commission, a fact that will become important later, who were uh, in southern Thailand trying to uh, address the impact of the tsunami on migrants, especially Burmese migrants. So she put me in touch with them. And that's the second site of fieldwork then is in three southern provinces that were disproportionately affected by the tsunami. So those provinces were the ones that lined the Andaman coast. Um, <clears throat> not the, these are not the only ones on the coast. Uh, you can see on the, the maps here, Ranong, Panga, and Phuket are the three where the lawyer's team was doing work and therefore where I was doing work. But other provinces like Kabi and Trang, they were also hit. They're just not where the lawyers were working, uh, largely because of the density of Burmese migrants in those three provinces. This section then also prompts the reader to uh, central aspects of my overall thesis. So first of all, that existing, familiar, <clears throat> everyday social conven conventions having to do with face work, status, and patron-client relations have been a source of the force that demands for human rights have drawn upon. This will come to seem curious, uh, counterintuitive in a way, that the, the very things that maintain status that are organized around supporting elites are the very same sorts of social conventions that then provide human rights with the force to assist the most marginal, most vulnerable, lowest status people in the country, Burmese migrants. Second, that this novel thing, human rights, drawing force from familiar sources face work status, patronage, can have this kind of disorienting effect on the people who are immersed in those forms of sociality, who are then um, subject to the forces of these conventions in completely unanticipated directions. That is, again, that they are compelled by the um, by the force, again, for lack of a better word, by the force of these conventions, they are compelled to do work on, on behalf of Burmese migrants. Uh, again, something completely counterintuitive. Usually these sorts of uh, stratifying social structures are organized around channeling power upward toward those who are in um, superior or more powerful positions. And here, those very all of all of the anxieties around maintaining face, around uh, sustaining one's position within the strata of uh, patron-client relations within a bureaucracy and so forth they become sort of inverted in this curious way so that the anxieties continue to exist, but they continue to exist in a way that starts to channel power downward through sort of this novel conduit of human rights toward the, the most 
subject people in the country. And then third, this provides opportunities for experimentation, both with human rights advocacy and with those forms of sociality. So again, that's a move that is uh, somewhat familiar from the chapter on uh, Buddhism, experimenting with fate, uh, applied to a different phenomenon here, but one, one that is comparable in important ways. It's not entirely coincidental then that that this would reproduce the same kind of move from experimenting with fate. Why? Because it's not a move that, so to speak, that I'm creating, but one that I'm trying to bring into relief to explain what's going on. So then uh, what's going on with status, face work, and patron-client relationships, what I focus on in this uh, in this essay, is not innocent of all of the same things that I discussed in Buddhism. Again, the, the way that uh, the dominant strain of Buddhism uh, is operationalized in Thailand justifies social strata, justifies inequality. So then it's exactly those same sorts of uh, um, social concerns um, and uh, sort of uh, the, the attention given to things like maintaining one's position, um, working to support one's superiors, seeking patronage of a powerful, superior powerful uh, patron in or if you're in a subordinate position, organizing uh, significant portions of your life around sustaining their sort of um, their their aura, if you will, of power of being a member of the elite and um, and and of merit and uh, of, of sort of a good karmic disposition. So the, the social conventions, in other words, are not distinct from Buddhism, that Buddhism and these sorts of social conventions are knit into one another. They're just part of everyday sociality. The essay then uh, picks up other ways that human rights advocates work on these same kinds of social forces to advocate in this circumstance for Burmese migrants who are hit by the tsunami. And in doing so, they simultaneously rely and uh, but very subtly alter how these familiar kinds of social conventions direct social power. As I say, the entire organization of these social uh, conventions is meant to channel power upward toward people in superior positions toward more powerful, richer people, uh, those who are perceived to have a greater store of merit because of their positions of superiority and relative comfort. Here then we're seeing something of an inversion. Uh, it makes the point, however, that rather than having this kind of independent existence, free of uh, cultural or uh, social, um, free of a, a cultural or a social existence that simply inserts itself into political settings, human right, rights are only what people do with them in specific social climates. So then human rights don't have a life beyond the cultural social existence within a particular community that they take on. They don't have uh, some kind of, um, it's, it's not like they, they float around above particular social arrangements and then just inject themselves into those arrangements, but rather it's through existing forms of sociality that human rights take on a life within a community. These lawyers then constitute what human rights are 
as they experiment with them through ordinary sociality. So again, it's not like human rights have some kind of life and then these lawyers try and wedge it in, but rather it's through experimenting with human rights within ordinary sociality that human rights are able to take on some kind of a life within this community. So now we turn to Burmese migrants in Thailand. Now, for a long time, uh, Burmese and Siamese kingdoms, Siam being the, uh, the, the, the dynasties that preceded uh, Thailand, um, Siam became Thailand in, in, um, after a coup in 1932 that uh, switched the absolute monarchy for a constitutional monarchy, and then several years after that, uh, they introduced a, na a name change from Siam to Thailand, Mung Thai. Before that, though, there was a long history of mutual conquest between Burmese and Siamese kingdoms. And um, one of the sort of flashpoints <clears throat> was the comprehensive destruction of a previous capital, Ayutthaya, in the 1700s and um, by the Burmese, that is. And uh, Thai, Thai people, not all Thai people, but many Thai people, uh, I'd, I'd say the default position of Thai people is to carry a, a kind of um, resentment toward present day Burmese from that moment through to the present. And so uh, this means that there are powerful biases at work, again, not among all Thai people by any stretch, but enough that it puts Burmese migrants in a, a fairly continuously perilous position within Thailand. It makes their lives difficult. Nonetheless, there's still a huge migrant population of Burmese citizens in Thailand. And, um, and there are many reasons for this, some of which I outline in the chapter. What it comes down to is that for, for multiple different reasons, the people who migrate are uh, pursuing what they take to be greater opportunities for a better or easier or less violent life than the one that they see around them while they're in Burma. And, uh, and also some of them um, would prefer not to enter military service, which was mandatory. It may still be mandatory. Um, and, and so they find that migrating to Thailand is a very nice alternative to that. The result of this then is that you get very large populations of Burmese migrants some of whom are there with uh, proper visas and work permits, some of whom are not, um, and, and they will work alongside one another. And many of them settle in the provinces of Renong, Panga, and uh, Phuket, because, partly because the provinces that, of Thailand that are closest to Burma are those three, uh, in the south that is, not, not further north. And so they're the easiest to get to, but also because there are industries there that are well suited to uh, Burmese migrant labor. So then when the tsunami struck the Andaman coast of Thailand, there were thousands and thousands of Burmese migrants already living as I say, kind of perilous, tenuous lives who, who were just devastated. They lost their homes in many cases. Uh, they lost family members, of course. Uh, if they had paperwork, they probably lost the paperwork. They lost all or most of their belongings. Um, and, and they had nothing to fall back on. They didn't have bank accounts that they could just go and draw on. Uh, so, so they were they were in terrible shape 
as a result of the tsunami. Not they alone, of course. Others were um, uh, affected in many of the same ways, losing family members, losing homes, and so on. Uh, the point for the lawyers, though, is that the Burmese have this added layer of opprobrium, of, of a, a, something appro approaching hatred a lot of the time, that they also had to contend with. So you can see here, the um, on the left, you can see before and after images of uh, the, the land that in uh, a part of Phuket in Kaolak, a place that we went, uh, the first place that we went, in fact, when, when I accompanied them, that uh, was up to about a kilometer inland, just completely flooded. Um, there's a, a, a ship, a police patrol ship, for example, that has now become a museum that was lifted by the wave and deposited almost a kilometer inland. So it, as you're driving down the highway, you have the beach on one side and the sea, and then on the other side of you, there's this ship that somehow just got plopped there. Well, the tsunami plopped it there. So, so it was it was extraordinarily powerful and devastating, and um, and as you can see from the other map, there were in Renong there were 160 dead, um, at least that, that we know of. In Panga, over 4,000. In Phuket, another uh, 279, and then in the southern provinces below that as well, there were there were others. Uh, so then. Uh, you, you can get some sense of the scope of the devastation from the tsunami. And these, uh, Renong, Panga, and Phuket, the hardest hit areas were also the areas with the largest Burmese migrant populations. So they would be disproportionately affected there. Um, okay, so then the what, what drew them, the Burmese, to these areas? Uh, well, for one thing, there's a vibrant tourist economy, so you could sell knickknacks, t-shirts, what have you, in um, in the near the resorts or near the beach, in Phuket and Panga. Uh, there is a lot of construction in that area, where Burmese workers would would be um, the the choice of many employers. Rubber tapping was another uh, industry that employed a lot of Burmese migrants. And the seafood industries, from uh, the fishing itself to the to fish processing, uh, shrimp processing, and so forth, these these were all major employers of uh, major employers in many cases, uh, but also these were the industries that that um, especially the seafood industry that were the preserve of human traffickers who would. Um, essentially use Burmese workers as slave labor. Um, we'll get back to that anyway. That, of course, the slave labor is not what drew Burmese migrants to the area, but the opportunity to work in these industries, especially industries where there were already other Burmese workers and so they could feel some kind of affinity with their co-workers, they were major draws for people to this area. But the attractions were not without their compensating costs. There was this persistent fear of Thai officials, all types of Thai officials, didn't, didn't matter if they were police or, or military or what have you. Thai officialdom was in general enough to cause anxiety in the Burmese communities um, because they saw the, uh, the police above all as this kind of uh, continuous threat so that they didn't see police and think, oh, okay, good, here's somebody who can help me with whatever problem besets me. They would see police and, and see a threat, rather. Part of the, the threat, the worst end of that threat, the most extreme manifestation of it that they feared, and not without reason, is that should they get arrested, they may then uh, spend some time in jail, but then be transported to the border with Burma, where they would be 
uh, either handed over or sold to Burmese border police, who would then in turn sell them into human trafficking circuits that would reroute them back into Thailand to work in possibly the same industries, uh, but now as trafficked individuals. So again, that would be something akin to uh, slave labor, where they, they wouldn't get paid, they wouldn't have freedom of movement. Uh, one employer might sell or trade them to another employer, uh, em employer, I'm perhaps using that word mistakenly, uh, business person, let's say. Uh, and and this, is, this is what they were most afraid of. This is the thing that caused them uh, the greatest anxiety with respect to the police. It was no picnic getting arrested by the police uh, for, for other charges and having to sit in jail. That was, that was not great either. But that was not the thing that, that caused them the most acute fear. It was this threat of trafficking. And the tsunami made that feeling of vulnerability much, much greater. And so the, uh, the, the lawyers who I accompanied then knew that the because they were in touch with uh, Burmese NGOs in the area, knew that Burmese uh, who had survived the tsunami were not anxious to participate in the DNA testing programs that were up and running because they were handled by the police. So the context is you had uh, many thousands of uh, the bodies of dead people, people who had been killed by the tsunami, who were not readily identifiable. And so they established this DNA testing program so that people who were relatives of people who were missing could give a DNA sample. The um, DNA testing program would also keep a database of DNA from the dead who they had recovered, and so then they could compare and find out if there were familial matches. Um, the, the Burmese community communities, of course, lost people to the tsunami, uh, but those who survived, as I say, were very, very apprehensive about participating in anything official, and especially anything official run by the police, as this program was. So the lawyers were working with a number of NGOs that had set up this kind of parallel program, one that wasn't run by the police, in other words, so that the Burmese who did survive would be able to go and um, get like cheek swabs for their DNA and then maybe find out if their relatives were among those who had been killed by the tsunami. Okay, vulnerabilities. The fear that police contact uh, could wind up with being trafficked into, um, say, the fisheries industry, where you might be compelled to spend many months or even years on a ship without touching shore, without contact with anyone um, outside the ship, and forced to labor under whatever conditions the owners and operators of the ship determined and they could be quite grueling uh, of course with nothing like like health care uh, probably if you became badly injured on the ship while you were working that 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 would be uh, extremely bad possibly fatal for you um, so then there was this fear that uh, after the tsunami that you were much more vulnerable as a Burmese migrant to be trafficked if you came across the police. Um, but that wasn't the only place that it happened. So I give a couple of examples. Uh, one is of an interview that uh, a, a different group that, that I was um, sort of connected to, the Labor Rights Promotion Network, did in Mahachai. In, uh, it's a port town just south of Bangkok uh, with a, a woman named Tong and her brothers. And then another was an example of this boy, Zha, who was killed in Phuket. 
these two examples in their different ways demonstrate the avoidance of police that was just absolutely habitual for Burmese migrants. So Tong and her brothers explain how um, the idea of the police helping out if you should get into a conflict with Thai people was absolutely ludicrous. They, they knew that if they got into conflicts with Thai people, that the police would absolutely take the side of Thai people, no matter what had happened. And that meant that for many people, many Burmese people in Mahachai, uh, they felt like they were always sort of easy pickings for any Thai person who, who wanted to uh, hassle or exploit a, a Burmese person because they, they would have no legal recourse, they felt. If they went to the police, they risked not only not getting help with their case, but they, they risked getting arrested by the police just because they had shown up and they were now in the presence of officers. That was the kind of fear that they had. Za, on the other hand, was selling tourist trinkets in Phuket on one of the main drags in Phuket near the beach. And the police had started coming and uh, arresting uh, vendors around the area. So when he saw that, uh, uh, evidently he had papers, so he was there legally. But again, his legal status isn't the point. The point is that he was so afraid upon seeing the police that he just bolted. And he got, he got hit by a tuk-tuk, uh, one of these three-wheeled um, mo motorcycle taxis, and, and he died. Um, now, why would Zal run? If he had the documentation to the, the visa and the work permit to work as he was, why would he run? Well, because trafficking wasn't the only thing that was worrisome. If they should get arrested, they would get thrown in jail. Um, very often, their employers uh, would hang on to their to the original copies of their documents, of their visa and work permit, for example, and leave them only with photocopies. The photocopies didn't actually have any legal weight to them at all. And so uh, that meant that when the police did come around and round them up, that people like Za might have photocopies of their documentation, but they would find themselves arrested anyway. And then they would have to wait it out until their employer showed up, if their employer showed up, with the original documents to show that, no, no, this, this person actually does work legally, does have a visa to stay here legally, and so then you might get freed. But you wouldn't know when that would happen. You wouldn't be sure that it would happen. And so um, just better to avoid the police in the first place. Now, compounding this was... Uh, the additional facts that many Burmese were uh, illiterate generally, but in particular in Thai. Uh, they often didn't have a very good command of Thai. And so doing things like getting replacement documents would be um, nearly impossible for them. And so they would have to rely on uh, brokers to do it for them. And so they would also become reliant on the brokers. They couldn't be sure that the documents that they had were actually the documents that they needed. They couldn't be sure that these weren't just things that uh, someone had kind of ginned up saying that these are official documents when in fact they weren't. They would to some extent just have to take that on faith, but they wouldn't want to test it, right? They wouldn't want to find out if the documents really were official or if they were just something that, uh, that some someone posing as a broker had printed up at home on a printer and, and sold, sold to them as if they were the real deal. Um, so all of these things then meant that they felt the constant threat that the police could arrest them on any pretext, whatever, and they would have little or no legal recourse if that happened. So they they lived with this uh, just kind of 
constant vulnerability. On top of this, if a migrant got injured at work, they were often left on their own to deal with their injuries. So there was one fellow, um, this was again after the tsunami, and they were in the process of rebuilding um, many buildings. One of them was a school. And, uh, and so there was this Burmese worker who uh, had, who was working on this construction site and had fallen, uh, I guess from uh, a significant height and had landed on his head and had, um, had been in a coma ever since. And so uh, a friend of his, another Burmese worker who, who was uh, also working in that construction site, went to a contact that he had that was connected to the group that the lawyers was connected to. And so sort of through this chain, we'll get back to the topic of networks in a moment, through this chain had gotten the lawyers to go and um, first of all visit the this fellow who was still in a coma at the time in the hospital and uh, and to to talk to his friend to see if there was anything that they could do. So ultimately, they did talk to the employer and uh, I think applied some pressure and the lawyer, uh, the, the employer rather, uh, who, who was a legitimate employer in this case, he, he was not um, using this particular worker as slave labor. Uh, the, the lawyer actually did, uh, the, the lawyer, the employer did actually st step up in the end and covered all of this fellow's medical bills. Uh, now, I left before he came out of this coma, so I don't know if he ever did. But um, the point is that without this group of lawyers and without the connections through NGOs that this friend of the injured worker had, Without that, uh, there's there's no guarantee, even that the employer would even, would find out where the injured worker was, which hospital he was in, or what state he was in. Much less that he would ensure that his hospital bills were covered. Um, so, uh, so that's one set of concerns. Then, if you get hurt on at work, you're probably on your own, and um, and if it's serious, then you probably don't have the legal, social, or uh, economic resources to deal with the injury or to confront your employer to get your employer to, uh, to, to compensate you. By the same token, then, if employers, and I, I say this because these are cases that we heard about, if employers decide that they want to lock workers in their rooms. And uh, seriously, uh, close the door, apply padlock. If they want to do that to keep them in their rooms overnight and um, therefore refuse them freedom of movement and freedom of association, then um, or to, to keep them on boats for months or years at a time, as I was saying, uh, there, there's not really much that the migrants could do about that. These were sort of the conditions that they had to accept with the uh, constant uh, either realized or potential threats that underlay them. So now the networks, like the, like the network that this friend of the injured worker could draw on to get the lawyers involved. So there, there were uh, several NGOs of uh, different degrees of global reach that were <clears throat> involved in the DNA testing facilities, in the uh, rights promotion that the lawyers engaged in. And um, so, so you can imagine this sort of large network of NGOs the members of the NGOs might belong to more than one NGO, of course, and will have contacts between them so that 
the Law Society of Thailand, which is uh, the organization from which the lawyers came who I was accompanying, the Labor Rights Promotion Network, who overlapped significantly with the Law Society of Thailand, but also had their own kind of, um, their, their own staff and their own projects independently of the Law Society, uh, the Seafarers Union of Burma, um, the uh, Thai Action Committee for Democracy in Burma, um, and, and many, many, many other organizations. So the largest was probably the IOM, which is the International Organization of Migrants. And then the, the smallest was probably the Seafarers Union of Burma. So you had all of these NGOs at different scales operating in some degree of coordination with one another. And it, they would allow the, uh, the lawyers to provide access to migrants, things like human rights, things like legal advice, things that could compensate to some degree the migrants' deficits of power. And, uh, and so uh, this, is, this is alongside the DNA pro testing project, part of what the lawyers from the Law Society of Thailand were doing in the South. And so they would coordinate with this huge array of NGOs in order to get the broadest possible reach, but also the finest possible reach. So that the maximum number of people, maximum number of migrants in the area could be aware that these networks existed, that there were channels for them to get help if they needed. In this way, then, they could do things like provide legal help to this worker who was in a coma. They could um, provide seminars, which they did, to tell migrants in the area what sorts of rights they had and how they could gain access to those rights by contacting organizations that would put them in touch with lawyers, for example. So one of them, this is from the Labor uh, Rights Promotion Network in Mahachai. And uh, so there, this, is, this is from one of their seminars where, uh, again, Mahachai had uh, a really substantial Burmese population. Um, one, one person from LPN told me that of the roughly 300,000 people in Mahachai, around 100,000 were Burmese migrants. So, so they were very substantial. And as you see in, in the chapter, so substantial that they, they had their own uh, Buddhist temple built there and that they would have paid for themselves it w that would have been the work of the community and um uh so so you know that's that's a big stake to set down in this community that shows an established burmese population there in any case so the lpn would hold seminars to uh help make sure that the Burmese migrants in the area knew what their rights were, knew, knew if, as you see in the top part of the, the, uh, the image here, that if an employer abused them, then the friend, I guess, of the, of the worker here could uh, gain access to the different sorts of networks. So you have the LPN, Below the LPN, you have uh, a connection to a lawyer who who would be the sort of person from the Law Society of Thailand who is connected to the LPN. So that they they were trying to map out visually here as as well as uh, orally how it is that even as such a, a marginal person as a Burmese migrant in Thailand, you could gain access to the kinds of legal resources that you would need to protect yourself legally, but also to, to defend your rights in the face of a, a, an employer who was 
say, not enthusiastic about paying you properly. Um, it was through these kinds of networks then that the NGOs were able to enhance, to some degree, the uh, access to legal counsel, legal advice, and therefore to real rights that the Burmese migrants in the area would, would get. Uh, but then this kind of education was just one aspect of the work that human rights advocates would do. Um, and Im important parts of the work of protecting migrants' rights occurred in their contacts with officials. So it wasn't just that they were making contacts through their networks of NGOs with, um, with Burmese migrants who needed some kind of help. They would also do this through contacts with officials. And this is where issues of status and face come into play. So if you are an officer, let's say a police officer, in a, a local police department, say say in Renong, because that's the case that we'll look at. So you're, you're say, just a, a, a fairly low-level officer, the kind of officer who might do some um, investigation into some cases or uh, might, might work a desk uh, as people come into the department, what have you, so, low level like that. Um, you, would be, you would be engaged in, first of all, a bureaucratic structure. Again, we covered this with, uh, with Hertzfeld, so this should be somewhat familiar. A bureaucratic structure that has some idea of advancement through uh, the quality of work that you do, but would also be um, uh, completely saturated with these conventional forms of sociality. So that you would, you would have a superior, but you would have a kind of patron-client relationship with superiors within the police hierarchy. And um, therefore, issues of face work become important for you. Why? Because if you become an embarrassment for your superiors who essentially have a clientage kind of relationship with you, then or a patronage relation, depending which way you want to look at it, if you become an embarrassment to them, then that's trouble for you, right? You, you can't risk them losing face because of something that you do. Uh, so this can happen in a couple of different ways. I gave an example in the chapter about this um, uh, girl who lived in a who lived in a in a, uh, a a large home in Bangkok, where I happened to be staying for uh, a period during uh, a trip there when I was um, nineteen, and so before my field work, in other words. And uh, she, she was 11 or 12 at the time, and she was taking English, English classes and uh, was finding it, as Thai people typically do, very difficult to make sounds associated with TH in English. And so, so we worked on that, and we figured out what, um, what she needed to do to be able to make the sound successfully and, and uh, reliably. And she could do it, and uh, she was very proud of that. Hooray! So she went to school the next day, and when she came back, I asked if her teacher was impressed, and uh, and she said that no, 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 she she hadn't she hadn't spoken that way with her teacher. She hadn't shown her teacher that she could successfully make these sounds, this, that, the, none of that. Why? Because her teacher couldn't do it, and so if she were able to do something in English that her English teacher couldn't do, then her teacher would lose face. So then this girl, Tukata, uh, refrained from doing that. It was part of her responsibility, she felt, to keep her teacher from losing face in this way. So that's one thing. But you can also, of course, do things 
um, that are simply embarrassing. So that will cause you to lose face. And because you lose face, it has this sort of contagious quality and your superiors will lose face by association. This is the kind of thing that was important in the case of police. So th things like status and face are concerns you simply can't ignore. You can't pretend that they're not there. The consequences are too grave. And so as an officer, you need to ensure that you don't lose face in a way that will then affect your superiors and cause them to lose face. That would be something like career suicide for you. And, and it would be bad for your superiors. So then the, the, um, the value of the patronage that they're able to offer you also diminishes. So it's, it's a serious concern, in other words. So one of the most important then, but counterintuitive characteristics of face work is this idea that it's not the concern of the individual alone, that rather it has this sort of contagious potential moving upward so that, um, so that your loss of face as a subordinate becomes a loss of face that your superior also has to deal with. And of course, the superior is going to be able to maintain that position of being a patron only on the strength of not losing face, face of having a, a powerful reputation of somebody who's able to get things done, for example. So then when we were talking about this in the chapter on Buddhism and human rights, um, we saw that superordination and subordination have this religious explanation, right? That it has to do with kama and merit. Uh, and there's this corresponding offshoot in social forms. So that um, sort of you, you are born into the life that you deserve. And if that means that you are born into uh, a relatively poor and powerless position, then the thing that you have to do in the temporal world, the, 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 like the actual world, not, not the religious sphere, is enter into patron-client relations uh, because that secures you in some ways. Uh, and, and this then also uh, develops into that kind of segmentary organization that Hertzfeld pointed out, where you have factions that develop, factions of say, um, clients who are associated with a particular patron. So um, a couple of uh, Thai economists, uh, Pasuk and Sung, uh, Sung Sid, capture this idea of seeking this temporal security through patron-client relations to compensate for karmic insecurity like this. They say, little people must find a patron and offer respect, gifts, and services in order to ensure favor and security. Big people, patrons, try to build up their clientele in order to maximize the flow of gifts and favors. People in high office must generate enough money to provide resources and protection for their followers in order to maintain their loyalty in the context of keen competition among different factions, right? So again, you can see how the same principle that Hertzfeld was talking about of a segmentary organization exists here as patron-client relations, that the patron-client relations form the segments, that they can ally when necessary to ward off uh, aggression from some other group of factions, but then once that threat is gone, they'll break back down into competing, um, competing stables of patrons and clients. We can see then how both patrons and clients, superiors and subordinates, have stakes in the patron-client relationship. And they both therefore have a keen interest in maintaining face, especially maintaining face in a way that avoids the superior losing 
his or her status and position. But there are different ways of losing face. Um, there are two principal ones that I encountered uh, when I was there, that I learned about when I was there. Uh, one uh, is not that. And this is a less serious thing. This, this is, uh, I give an example of this fellow, Jung, who um, uh, toward the end of one of our trips, <clears throat> when we were, uh, we, had, we had spent the night at a hotel in Pachup Kirikan, I think it was. Anyway, um, by, by the sea. A lot of Thailand in the south is by the sea, so that's not remarkable. But So this was this little resort by the sea. And he came in in the morning, and, and before um, many of us were awake in the room I was in, and woke everyone up because he wanted everyone to go out to the beach and, um, and, and was not enthusiastic about the idea that only some of us would go to the beach and others of us would just continue sleeping. Uh, I was one of those who wished to sleep more than I wished to go to the beach and um, evidently did not contain my irritation very successfully at being wakened up. So later, the, um, the chief lawyer, uh, the, the highest uh, sort of uh, highest ranking lawyer in the group uh, made a joke at Jung's expense, pointing this out, pointing out that, that he had been an annoyance in the morning and, and did it in a laughing and joking way, but it was a joke that everyone else could laugh at, but that Jung could not participate in that laughter. He couldn't treat it as um, as something to laugh at. Why? Because it was also implicitly a chastisement of him. And and also he couldn't he couldn't give any sort of riposte to it because uh, he was the subordinate in this case. And so it would have been insubordinate for him to, um, to, to respond aggressively to this. So then he had suffered not that, not anything too serious. He didn't like it much. It wasn't comfortable. It didn't make him happy. But it's not like his honor and his standing were thrown into question. Uh, there, it was just this temporary embarrassment that he had to to sort of accept and then move on with. Uh, it was an opportunity, perhaps, for this uh, superior lawyer to um, discipline him in uh, a, an informal way, but nonetheless an effective way. And um, and so this is something that is an unhappy occurrence for the individual who experiences it, but it doesn't do much of anything to alter your status within a group. It's not that serious. Siena, on the other hand, is serious. So with that, you have not this idea of a cracked face. So that means cracked or broken. Here, we're talking about lost face. This is the one that's serious. This is where you have some kind of a public embarrassment that is of such a, a type that it can undermine your status within a group. And therefore, if you're a subordinate, can undermine the status of your superior, of your patron. And because now your honor and your status are at stake, it's the recipient feels a compulsion to respond in some way, to recover that lost face. The case that I make in the paper then is that it's not only powerful people who have face enough to lose in the case of Siena. Rather, it has to do with the relative positions of the individuals involved and of those who are, so to speak, an audience to the loss of face. So that for somebody of status and stature to lose face in the presence of subordinates it would be completely unacceptable. You would have to address that. You would have to uh, recover your face in those circumstances. Uh, or even amongst equals, it, would, it could imperil or be felt to imperil your position among equals. It might 
push you down a notch. And so I give these a uh, couple of examples of um, a motorcycle taxi driver in one case and a police officer in another who suffer a public loss of face in this way before people who could be their peers or subordinates who feel like they need to respond. They, they can't just let it slide. To let it slide would make the loss of face even worse. And, uh, and, and they resort to homicide to do it and then to suicide in both cases. So that uh, part of the point here then is that losing face in the sense of Siena is, um, is of such a gravity that it can have lethal implications. It, it's not something that you can simply ignore. It's not something that you can pretend didn't happen. It's something that requires some kind of address. And so uh, sometimes it can lead to these extremely drastic outcomes of, of homicide. But in other cases, there, there are other forms of retaliation that it can take, but that it will require some kind of retaliation. Now, elites often will handle this in a different way so that the tempo of their response will be slower. Uh, the way that it will unfold will be over a longer period of time. Very often, elites will try to do it in such a way that they use their economic resources to drain the resources of the person who has made the allegation that has caused them to lose face. And we're not talking about defamation here. Uh, lost, lost of face is more serious when the allegation is true than when it's not, in most cases anyway. So, so it's not about dealing with defamation simply. But if you can drain the resources of the person who's made the allegation that has caused you to lose face to such an extent that they, they risk destitution, then you can force them publicly to retract the thing that they've said and to reverse the flow of lost face, to make a public statement, say, claiming that what they had said was not true and that they would have to make it in um, a public venue that was broad enough that it would become widespread news so that then the person who made the allegation would wind up being the one who lost face for having lied in this terrible way, whereas the elite would have been able, in a sense, to use his or her economic resources to recover his or her face. But it would still, it would require some kind of retaliation of that sort, just not necessarily of the murderous sort that we saw in the other two examples. Um, this concern then with losing face is what gave the human rights lawyers a certain kind of leverage in their interactions with officials. The lawyer's work then was bracketed by the Human Rights Commission. So it's not the case that any old person could use these uh, levers of face work, for example, in order to apply pressure to, say, a police officer. A police officer, uh, perhaps, who was reluctant to devote energy and resources to investigating crimes against Burmese migrants. This is the case that we're going to look at in a moment. And, um, and so part of the trouble that a lot of NGOs and even lawyers who work for NGOs run into is that they don't have the kind of uh, clout that they need to use this, this lever of face work status and so forth to compel the police to investigate properly. Why? Because the, what happens if, if the police decline to do what the NGO lawyers ask them to do? What happens? Well, nothing. They can't really, they don't really have the resources 
to publicize this. They don't really have the resources to go up the chain of command to, um, to get their superiors to apply pressure. So it's important that the Human Rights Commission is involved here. The Human Rights Commission has the legal mandate to demand documents of officials, of Thai officials. So then when the lawyers from the uh, Law Society of Thailand go to the police station in Ranong and demand documents, as uh, lawyers working on behalf of the Human Rights Commission, they actually have um, a couple of things working for them. First of all, they have now the constitutional right to demand these documents, which other NGO lawyers do not have. And secondly, the Human Rights Commission it has enough uh, stature and enough scope that they can expose police who are not willing or have uh, been disinclined to do proper investigations of, say, human trafficking. And that, that has real implications. Now you're risking um, exposure of being uh, a lazy or an incompetent or uh, a recalcitrant, recalcitrant officer in a way that will reflect badly on your superiors. So this is not something that they can just ignore. Secondly, then, there must be an actual or perceived transgression by the officials. There has to be something to expose. So that if, say, um, officers are in fact investigating properly, but they just can't locate the documents that the, that the Law Society lawyers want right at that moment, well then, they're, they're not at great risk. When they do locate the documents, they'll show that in fact they have been doing their jobs and they'll be okay. So th there has to be a real threat. It can't just be uh, an imaginary threat that they're confronting. Third, the officials uh, have in turn to recognize the threat of public exposure that the Human Rights uh, Commission investigate <clears throat> investigation promises. Again, it makes sense, right? That that if some um, officer in in a small department somewhere, who's not perhaps all that familiar with human rights or the institutions in Thailand, doesn't it isn't aware that the Human Rights Commission has this kind of investigative power and the ability to publicize transgressions, then uh, they they might just carry on as as they always have without any particular feel, uh, fear. Now, things might turn out badly for that individual down the road when they do get exposed, but in the immediate run, uh, they, they have at least to be aware that the Human Rights Commission had this sort of power. And then the, the final thing then, now the, the last piece, is the ubiquity of attentiveness to status and face work. So this is what gives losing face its force. And this then, th this combination of factors, this is what gives human rights the uh, potential for inverting the direction of the flow of power rather than face work and status channeling power upward toward elites. Now the, the sort of mid-rank uh, officials realize that, oh, no, we actually need to attend to the rights of these maligned Burmese migrants who otherwise we would just ignore or not care about. But now we actually have to attend to their rights properly so that um, we don't embarrass our superiors by being exposed as having this cavalier attitude toward doing our jobs. So then in Ranong, we see the convergence of these factors, uh, as, as I cover in the, uh, in the essay and in the chapter. As I noted above then, for many Thai, the Burmese are the most reviled of people. And that's part of the reason that the police have felt a certain kind of license to just ignore 
uh, transgressions against Burmese people, to choose just not to investigate them, to have a kind of cavalier attitude toward trafficking. After all, the people who are trafficking Burmese migrants are fellow Thai, and as an officer, you might feel more inclined to support your fellow Thai business person who just happens to be into human trafficking rather than investigating properly and defending the rights of the Burmese migrants who are exposed to trafficking uh, and who are exposed to the kinds of um, often slave labor conditions that they find themselves in after they've been trafficked. So they're, they're required to do this. That's their legal mandate. Is, is to, to carry out these investigations. But they've, they've long felt uh, like there, there's, there's no real compulsion to do this. So this is one thing then that the introduction of human rights uh, inverts. So in the example that, that I recount here, the lawyers were able to invert this kind of social power that has typically been used to exclude Burmese migrants to justify their abuse, or at least to justify turning a blind eye to their abuse, and use these forms of social power instead to uh, focus attention on sustaining the rights of, in this case, a migrant who had been a victim of human trafficking. So this is what's curious. In the hands of these lawyers, human rights could tap into the social conventions that usually secure power and privilege for officials and make those very same social powers appear as a threat to those officials, to, to officials at a variety of ranks indeed, while serving the most marginalized people in Thailand, the Burmese migrant. So th this is this counterintuitive sort of uncanny thing where the, the social forms and the social conventions remain in place, continue to function, but they seem to function now in upside down world where the flow of power is not in the direction it's supposed to be. Now it's doing this crazy thing where it's flowing downward instead of upward. Now, as a final note, it's worth noting that these same conventions did not work only as disciplining mechanisms. So that they did work as disciplining mechanisms, but that was not the only life that they had. In the case of Tekuapa prison, uh, which I um, also discussed in Experimenting with Fate, we can see how there's this very careful observance of status and face work between the prison warden and prison officials on the one side and lawyers from the Law Society of Thailand, uh, Chok Chai among them, uh, on the other, in order to facilitate what would otherwise be this kind of unexpected or unanticipated collaboration between lawyers and prison officials. Prison officials here becoming advocates for, alongside the lawyers, for protecting the legal rights and the human rights of Burmese migrants who are held as prisoners in Tekuapa prison. Again, this, this is occurring not because the lawyers were um, applying leverage to the prison officials to sort of coerce or embarrass them into uh, treating prisoners properly. Rather, it was this convergence of interest between the prison officials and the lawyers that were mediated through careful observance of status and face work to maintain the kind of collaboration that would allow the lawyers to do the educational work inside the prison for the prisoners held there that they were able to do. Now, if human rights, like any other rights, are available only to the extent that you can claim them, in actual fact claim them, so not just in principle, 
but in actual fact, claim them. What I've tried to outline in this essay is how the possibility of claiming rights occurs within these specifiable social circumstances. So then the articulation of human rights with social conventions is what allows for the redirection of social forces embedded in those conventions with these surprising, uncanny, unexpected results. And that's it. Thank you.